But let's go ahead and read Leviticus uh, chapter 23. And um, I'm going to actually read, let's see here, I'm going to read the passage of Scripture 23, and it's going to be verses 23 through 30. So hopefully you got a Bible that you can read because I have her on channel 2 because we're trying to see if we can connect the iPad. Uh, and if, if we can, I just had a couple things I was going to show you. All right, so here we go. Reading verse, start in verse 23. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this month there will be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And so we see in this passage of scripture, uh, we see two of the last feasts, if you will. And I was going to go ahead and uh, I guess I could I guess I could write it on the board or. Maybe it's not absolutely necessary, but we're going to go ahead and do it. So I put a little bit of a timeline up here, but going backwards, I want you to know that there's a there's really there's seven feasts total, and really eight if you include the Sabbath. And in reality, we really probably should include the Sabbath because the Bible does, but most people don't include the Sabbath day when they're teaching on the feasts. Um, and so if you don't include the Sabbath, then you have seven feasts. And I just want to remind you that the number seven is always interconnected to God's fulfillment or God's plan of perfection, right? On the sixth day, he created man. And then on the seventh day, he rested. And it wasn't that God needed to rest because the God of Israel never sleeps or slumbers. But instead, it was a type to remind us of the importance in rest. Now, I have to tell you that when it comes to the Sabbath, we can learn in the, in the letter to the Hebrews in chapters 3 and 4 that the Sabbath rest was really fulfilled in Jesus. Because the psalmist said that had, jo had Joshua given them rest, okay, in the Old Testament, whenever they entered into the promised land, then there wouldn't have needed to be a prophecy that there would be a future rest to come. And so the future rest that came, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Danya, the future rest that came was, uh, was, was Jesus, amen? And so with that said, um, I'm going to kind of like talk a little bit about that here in a moment. But so the, the first, so there's seven, there's seven feasts and the first four feasts are considered, considered spring feasts. I love that I always get that confused. We, all, we oftentimes call it Easter, but it really and truly, I'm not trying to be picky, but it shouldn't, we shouldn't call it Easter. We should call it resurrection. Yeah. So around the time of the resurrection is when these feasts are taking place. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. The reason we shouldn't call it Easter is because Easter comes from the goddess Ishtar. She was a Babylonian goddess. And so that's the whole concept of the fertility connected to the eggs and the rabbits and all this other kind of stuff that they do. That's just reality, okay? And so we should really focus on resurrection. But so these are the spring feasts. And I'm just kind of mentioning these real quick so that you know where we're going. So there's a Passover feast. Then there's unleavened bread, okay? And I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to spell, spell it all out. I ran out of room. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. And then, does anybody know the fourth one? Pentecost. That's right. So we have these first four feasts that take place in the springtime. All right? The significance of the first four feasts is this. Now, I, I wrote some other things up here. This is just a little bit of background information. That this is the Exodus. This is about the time frame that God told Moses to, to do these feasts. Now, one of the things we need to understand about the feasts was that they were a memorial to God's people to remember that they were God's people and that he was their God. So annually, every year, they did these feasts. Now, whenever we're talking about feasts, 
I wanted to try to give you an example, um, and this is maybe a bad example, but it's just the world that we live in, the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival. It's not a feast like that. That's a worldly feast, but the idea is, and you may not even know that, what they're memorializing when they have the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival is that the city of Morgan City was established on the oil and shrimping industry. And so there's a whole lot of other stuff that we could say that would probably be negative, but nevertheless, that's a worldly feast, and they do their thing that they do, and these kinds of things have been going on through the years. But the idea is that God said, my people are going to have a feast unto me, and they're going to come and they're going to celebrate. Every year, they're going to celebrate, and they're going to remember that they're my people and that I'm their God. And there were various things that he told them that they had to do. One was with all of these feasts, they had a Sabbath, sometimes multiple Sabbaths, meaning no work was to be done. They offered up multiple sacrifices in the midst of it all. Okay. And, um, and so that was what they would do. They would remember. Now, the reason that I put this is because if you go back and you read Exodus chapter 12, is where it talks about the Passover, unleavened bread. Okay. And, and, and so, and in the Bible, it uses the word Abib as the first month. Now, after they went to Babylon with the Babylonian captivity, after they came out, there's nowhere in the Bible that I have found where it talks about these, the names of these months that, that the Jews use today. These names came after they came out of the Babylonian captivity. Many of you, I think, in this room are familiar with the Babylonian captivity where the children of Israel, because of the failure of Solomon, the kingdom was split. And ultimately, God sent prophets to warn his people to turn from sin, right? And it's important that we understand that as Christians, because God's always sending his word to heal us and to have us to turn from sin. But many times we don't listen, we don't hearken, we don't yield to the will of God. And what happens is we find ourselves in captivity to the enemy. And it's a very similar concept that took place in the Old Testament, right? And so... They came out, though, and so the, the, in the Bible, the name of the first month, he said in the Passover, he said, this is going to be the first month unto you. All right, so Passover was done, all these first four feasts, these first three feasts were done in the first month, if you will, and then this was 50 days later. That's what the word penty means is 50, okay? And so he said, this is going to be the first month unto you. So he's about to bring them out of Egypt. They've been Egyptian slaves for 400 years. And he says, this is going to be the first month unto you. And so it's interesting to me. I've never seen anybody specifically teach it this way. It might be out there, but this is what the Lord showed me. Is that I believe, so they, they actually ended up having two new years. So this is the first month. The first four feasts take place around the first month, which is really in the springtime. Okay, and then the last three feasts take place in the seventh month, which we call Tishri now, which takes place more like in the fall, really. It starts now. The Feast of Trumpets is the first one, all right? And so, so what, what I see, so there's, and this is actually considered the new year for the Jews. The Rosh Hashanah, the blowing of the trumpets, is considered their new year. But they actually had have kind of like more than one new year. It gets a little bit confusing. They have a civil new year, and then they have a religious new year. Now, this is what's interesting to me. This is the first month, they said, and the first time Jesus came, number one, the first time he came, he fulfilled. This is interesting. This is very prophetic. Okay. He fulfilled Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. He's already fulfilled it. Okay, these were physical feasts that took place. You want to say every year, but in reality, I verify with Rabbi Ron, that, and it's in the Word of God, the Jews did not keep the Passover like they were supposed to. They, they quit take, keeping the Passover under Josiah the king. It is stated that finally under Josiah, they finally kept the Passover like it was intended for them to do all of those years. But nevertheless, they didn't. But look, this is showing, I believe, so number one, this is a, the first month because, and this is a new month for them because this is new life for them. See, this is just like it's new life for you. I'm going to talk about Passover a little bit. I'm getting a little deep into this stuff, which I didn't plan on doing. But, but Passover, we already know, is the lamb that, was, that did not have spot nor blemish. And you cut its throat, you collect its blood, and you paint it on the east side of the door frame and also on top. And then you go on the inside, you roast the lamb. You don't, you don't boil it in water and you don't eat it raw. 
and you roast them in fire. Why? Because fire is a type of judgment, and the judgment was placed upon the animal, and the judgment was placed upon the sacrifice just as a type that the judgment would be placed on Jesus for us. So you roast that lamb. You, you, you paint the doorpost, and you take that roasted lamb, and you bring it on the inside. This would be the inside of the house, and you don't go outside of the house. This is the first Passover night, and you consume that lamb completely, you and your family. And to be perfectly honest with you, I'm probably going to be preaching on the Passover on Sunday, all right? And so you consume that whole lamb, and there was a certain way that you told them to eat it. And it's like, you need to be ready, buddy, because it's about time to get up and get out. Okay, because I'm about to move you out of this world, which is Egypt, under the bondage of Pharaoh, which is the enemy of your soul. And I'm, get, I'm getting you up, and I'm getting you out, and I'm ready to deliver you. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah, get yourself ready. Yeah. So, he, so Jesus was crucified right there in the Passover. He was right, right there, you know, like he was crucified. He ate the Passover meal with his disciples the night that he was betrayed in the garden. Well, after they ate the Passover meal together, they crossed the brook Kidron. They ended up in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is praying, right? And you know the story. And he is he is taken into captivity. And, and he goes before the high priest and, and the Jews. And then the next thing you know, they bring him to Pilate. And the next thing you know, he's being nailed to the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then he dies at 3 o'clock time of the morning in the evening sacrifice. And then he's put into the tomb, all right? So he fulfills Passover. Paul said he's our Passover. I think it's 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He says, and he also fulfilled unleavened bread. Why? Because see, leaven is yeast. Yes. And yeast is a type of sin and false doctrine in the word of God. Because see, a little leaven leavens the lump. Just like a little bit of false teaching will mess up some stuff, so will just a little pinch of sin. Because, see, you put a pinch of sin in a batch. I'm not a baker, but yeast is an organism. And it spreads and it grows. And then it ends up taking over the whole batch of dough. And that's what sin will do in your life. If you open up your life to just a little pinch of sin, and anybody that's ever done it, you know what I'm talking about. I don't have to go into a detailed teaching on the power of sin because each and every one of us in this room have opened our life to it. We might even not be under its bondage right now. It's possible. Even though we're, we kind of like don't have a whole lot of people up in here right now, reality is, is that some, there might be more than one person in this place that right now you feel like a Hebrew slave caught in Egypt, and you can't get free. I got good news for you. Hallelujah. God sent his Passover lamb to set us free. Amen. And he was unleavened bread because he had no sin in him. See, God created Adam and Eve without sin. And then Adam took sin into himself, and the entirety of the human race was now born into sin with a sinful nature. So it doesn't do any good for you to die. I remember I told a Muslim lady one time, I said, but ma'am, listen, and there's a commentary, it's called the Hadith, and it's part of the Quran, and it said, with one drop of the martyr's blood, all of his sin is atoned. I said, man, that's a problem. Because you see, your sin is tainted, my sin is tainted, the martyr's, I'm sorry, your blood is tainted, my blood is tainted, the martyr's blood is tainted, you can't die, the wages of sin is death, you deserve to die, I deserve to die, the martyr deserves to die, Jesus had no sin. Hallelujah. That's why the grave couldn't hold him down. He came popping up out the grave because he had no sin. And he paid the penalty for the sin of mankind. So he he fulfilled the Passover. He fulfilled unleavened bread. But this is what was really amazing to me. Is that he said, so feast of first fruits. Now they didn't use the word Sunday. Okay. But that's the idea. The, the On the morrow, the day after the Sabbath after the Passover. I know that's confusing. First Sunday after the Passover. Because the Passover didn't have to land on the same day of the week, all right? So the first Sunday after the Passover was the Feast of First Fruits. So they'd start off celebrating the Passover, and then for a whole week, they would take all the yeast out of their houses, eat all their bread without any yeast. It was a big deal. They told them, sweep in the corners, look. All over in the shelf. Get all that yeast. Get all that yeast out your house. And the Lord's trying to tell us right now. Listen, I'm telling you right now, the Lord, we are in the last days, church. I don't know what else they're preaching out there. I talked to somebody recently, and the person told me that they never heard the word conviction before, and they've been in church almost all their life. Now, I don't know if they were really listening. I don't know, to be fair. 
But what I'm trying to say is this. Times have changed in the church. And that's a problem. Yes, yes. All right. And so, so Feast of First Fruits was the first Sunday that took place after the Passover. Well, that's amazing. Because, see, Jesus rose from the dead on the first Sunday after he died on the Passover night. Hallelujah. And then you start counting from Feast of First Fruits 50 days later, and it was the Feast of Pentecost. Now, I want you to get this. We're talking all this started in 1440 B.C., and we're talking about Jesus fulfilled it in 33 A.D. We're talking about 1,470 years or so. All of this going on throughout history, and Jesus fulfills it. And on the day of Pentecost, what did he do? He told the disciples to be in the upper room to tarry in, in Jerusalem and to wait for the gift that would come, that they would be endued with power from on high so that they could be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. You can't make this up. No. This, this, this is some powerful stuff, right? I believe. And so now we're going to move forward and we're going to look at this seventh month. So I think it's interesting because in the first time that he came, sometimes scholars will use the word first advent or Shall we say his incarnation, not reincarnation, incarn when he, when the word of God took on flesh, okay, when he became a man. We were singing that song in there in prayer. You, you know, Lord, you're worthy, you took on flesh, you're so beautiful. He took on flesh, okay, and he became us so that he could die for us. So in his first advent, he fulfilled all four of the feast that were in the first month. You get where I'm going with that? Okay. And then the seventh is the last three that are left to be fulfilled. Seven, the number of fulfillment, the number of completion. Now, I got to tell you that the Feast of Trumpets already started at about 3.30 or 2.30 this afternoon. So I'm pretty sure, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that the first trumpet's already blown. But there's a total of seven trumpets that are blown. And, and you got to look some of this up in tradition because it doesn't really say it in the Bible. And I'm not getting into tradition and that I'm also focused on the scripture. Now, there's some really cool types and shadows in the tradition. But I just want you to know that it's a succession of trumpet blasts that are going to go forward that are going to bring us again towards the Day of Atonement, which is going to take place 10 days after the first blow on the Feast of Trumpets which started today. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. And so again, I just want you to see that number seven right there. Now, because again, it's the number of fulfillment. Now, what's interesting, this is a little bit of background information, and we're going to start getting into the, into the scripture a little bit more here. What, what's interesting is, is this, is that on the new moon is for us, it, okay, so for Israel, their calendar was a lunar calendar. We live on a solar calendar. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we live on a solar calendar. They live on a lunar calendar. Their new month started every new moon. So this might be a little bit confusing, but for us, to, for them tonight, the new moon is tonight because they're eight hours ahead of us. All right. For us, the new moon will be tomorrow night. This is what the new moon's going to look like. You see how it, you may not be able to see it from over there, but there's just a tiny, tiny little sliver. Like, it's just on the very, very edge right there. And that would signify the new moon. You can barely see it. If I showed you the next one, if I, if I, went, if I went back to the next one, see this one, it's almost completely closed off. You, there's no sliver right there. So the new moon, and, and that's what it's showing. It's like this is the last stage before the whole new moon. Because if you go back again and you, and you, and you do the next one, now you see the little slivers on the other side. And so that's, what, that's how they knew that it was a new moon coming. And so he said on the, first, on the first day of the seventh month, you're going to have a holy convocation and you're going to blow the trumpet. That's how they knew that they were going to have their, when their new month was going to start, the first day of the new month. So they would wait outside and they would look, they would look to see the sliver on the moon in the sky. And they'd have to have, from what I remember reading, it's been a while, they would have to have more than one witness, and once they agreed, that's it. Ba -ba! They would blow the first horn, and it would initiate the Feast of Trumpets. And they would continue to blow these horns, and then it moves you into the Day of Atonement. And then last feast, I'm not going to really talk about that one at all, right now is the Feast of Tabernacles, 
all this stuff is very interesting. I've taught it many times, but the Feast of Tabernacles had to do with their wandering in the wilderness. This is so good right here. If you read at the very end of the book of Revelation, when the new heavens and the new earth descend, it says it's the tabernacle of God. And so he will be their God and they shall be his people. And what I get from that is, is that the wilderness journey is over, my friend. It's the new heaven and the new earth. And all of the wandering and all of the wilderness now is complete. There's no more journey. We've made it to the celestial city. Hallelujah. We made it through. Amen. And that's and that's what I what I gained from that. All right, Haley, you can go back to um, channel number one because I'll probably need some of your help with some scriptures at some part point in time. All right, Hallelujah. So we we got through through all of that and um, and we we talked about the Passover. We talked about the the new moon. Um, we talked about the fact that it was the seventh day, which is the time of fulfillment. So what I'm trying to tell you is, I didn't tell you this, but my, my title tonight is Feast of Trumpets, I'm Coming Home. Because I want you to know that there is a direct, within the scripture, correlation of the Feast of Trumpets and also connected to the rapture. Now, am I telling you the rapture is taking place tonight? No, I'm not. And, if you're, and listen, if your gold standard is Sunlight Radio, it's in the commentary. That the trumpet sound is interconnected to the rapture. Multiple commentators, multiple scholars see what I just told you. The first four came at the first advent. It stands to reason that the last three would come with his second coming to fulfill the plan of God. Now, can you prove it? No, you can't prove it until it happens, when it happens. Amen? But nevertheless, I want you to know that, that, and, and so, but what I, what I want to focus on tonight, what I feel like the Lord is leaving, leading me to focus on tonight, has to do with the blowing of the trumpet in preparation, moving you closer to the Day of Atonement. And the reason I don't want to talk to you about that is that you can do the research later for yourself. It doesn't talk about it in the Bible, but tradition is that when the trumpet blows, there's 10 days before you get to the Day of Atonement. And the Jews call it the 10 days of awe. All right. So here we go. In Leviticus chapter 23, if you put it on verse 23, we'll read it again. He says, and the Lord, uh, Leviticus 23, verse 23, the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, speak unto the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation, convocation, you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls. And offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in that day, for it's a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Affliction of the soul. The blowing of the trumpet initiates ten days of awe. And the word afflict means to chasten yourself, to be troubled, to humble yourself. Now, that might kind of like mess up New Testament thinking. Well, wait, hold on a second, preacher. You've been, for, for many years, you've been talking about the fact that I'm justified by faith. And if your faith is in Christ, you are justified by faith. You've been preaching for years that, that my sin was laid upon him and, and placed upon him and that he became a curse for me. Your sin was laid upon him. He did become a curse for you according to the book of Deuteronomy. But you and I are supposed to be looking introspectively on the inside of our heart, looking deeply on the inside of our heart. This goes along with work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This, is, this goes along with the Apostle Paul talking about judge yourself so that you won't have to be judged, right? And so many times, though, come on, church. I'm telling you the truth tonight. Many times we get complacent. 
We get complacent in our walk with God. And we start to think that we're okay when in reality, we may not be okay. Well, how do you know we may not be okay? Something very deceitful happens in our life when we let sin in. Listen to me. Something very deceitful happens. It's called a searing of the conscience. The conscience can become seared as with a hot iron. And we don't even feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit anymore like we used to. That's a problem. Because there will be many on that day. They say unto me, Lord, Lord, did we not lay hands on the sick and watch them recover? Did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not do this? Did we not do the works of the Lord? But he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Psalm chapter 4, verse 4, you don't have to turn there, but the first part of the sin, it says this, stand in awe and sin not. The word awe means to tremble, to shake, to be disquieted, to be troubled. You know, whenever we're talking about true repentance, I don't think that I can get this across enough. I think it's just so important, not that I'm trying to browbeat anybody, but I think it's so important that we as the church understand, try to get an idea of what maybe true repentance would look like. Because somehow, even in my own life, I've had the idea that, that repentance, it, you know, it's a change of mind. Okay, but, but what does that look like? Oh, I, does it look like, oh, I'm sorry, Lord? Like, is that, is, I'm just saying, I mean, yeah, that's part of it, saying I'm sorry, I, I believe. But, but it seems like it's got to be more than that. It, it seems like true repentance has to be, it's a change of the mind when we come to the realization that God's word said one thing. I believe something else, and I was still going against God's word, and then conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon my heart, and many times when you start to repent, many times you didn't even know you were wrong because at first, because the deception came in and started to sear the conscience, and then because of his mercy and his grace and the anointing of his Holy Spirit, he begins to allow us again to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And when we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we are supposed to respond to him in repentance and to let him know, Father, I'm sorry. Father, I was wrong. Father, forgive me. And this is, the, this is a powerful thing. This is what I've experienced in my own life. And I'm trying to share this with y'all. I'm trying to be very transparent with y'all. I don't know what else to do other than use myself as an example. But one of the things I've learned about repentance is that even though there's been times where I believe that actually, I'm just going to be real with you, I believe there's been times my conscience has been seared. Am I proud of it? Absolutely not. The Lord gave me a little bit of a word today. Listen, a seared conscience is a roadway to a reprobate mind. Whoa. A seared conscience can be a roadway to a reprobate mind. You don't want a reprobate mind. Like that. You don't want the love of God to be moved away from you. But His grace and His mercy he will roll up on you at the, at the when you least expect. <laughs> you can't outrun the long arm of the Lord. Amen. He loves you so much. David said, even if I make my bed in hell, you'll find me there. The Lord loves us and he doesn't want to give up on us. And I know they got some people that can testify to that truth in this place right now. Amen. Where you've been in some bad spots, some pre precarious situations where your conscience was seared. But yet, out of his grace and his mercy, wasn't even expecting it to happen. He just showed up and he changed everything. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Because he'll never forget. He'll never give up on Amen. Amen. And one of the things that I learned is when I open my heart up a little bit, it's kind of like he comes in more. And then when I respond to that some more, he start coming in more. I don't know about y'all, but I've experienced that. Like the more, I, and then sometimes I'm just like, I'm just thinking, I'm just keep on repenting. And <laughs> people are like, well, you don't have to keep repenting. Well, you don't know because sometimes the Lord is showing me something else. Oh, you got to repent of every little, you do it the way you want to do it. And I'm going to do it the way I feel like the Holy Spirit is telling me to do it. And if you don't think you need to, but whenever I get up in the presence of the Lord and he reminds me of something else, guess what? I'm dropping to my knees. And hallelujah, I was talking to a lady the other day we were talking about, I was talking about sometimes people, sometimes people that have been watching that I respect come against the, the emotional aspect of Christianity sometimes. And it's still, I still respect them because I believe that they're men of God. And to be honest with you, I'm like, 
kind of like want to flow in the spirit, kind of like they do, you know. So I'm not judging them, but I'm. But I was sharing with Elena. I'm like, you know what, though? I like feeling his presence. Amen. I like being humbled in his Amen. presence. I like it whenever I walk into the room and I just cry on the name of Jesus and I feel his presence fall on me. And all of a sudden I feel like Isaiah. I'm sorry. I feel like I feel like when I get in his presence, yes, when I get in the presence of a thrice holy God, like the preacher said, I start to feel, yes, I feel inadequate. I feel unworthy. But when I cry out, holy, 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 it's like he's pouring something into me and he's filling me up and he's strengthening me. He said, but I've made you right in my eyes, son, because you put your faith in the blood. Hallelujah. You're covered in the blood. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. There's power in that. That, that goes back to that message I preached a while back. It's Psalm 26. He said, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. Get up in there, Lord, and show me if there's something wrong with me. Sometimes it's not the big three sins or whatever, whatever those are. Amen. We're so focused on, you know, we used to do this, this, and this. We don't do that anymore. But what do? Lord, help us. You, I don't need to sit here and call it all out. Because if you got it in your heart, the Holy Spirit right now, I'm start showing it to you. Yes. Right? Yes. It's a yearly 10-day reminder of how important it is for the people of God to examine their hearts and allow God to speak to them. The trumpet blows. The feast begins, and now they afflict their souls, and they look deep, deep within, and they ask the Lord to inspect them. Amen? You know, there's this passage out of Jeremiah. It's an Old Testament passage, but you know what it talks about? It talks about the people of God not really understanding the judgment of God. Now, he, this is an Old Testament passage. I'm going to give you a New Testament one before we move forward. This is, this is out of Jeremiah chapter 8, starting verse 4. But it's talking about the people of God not really understanding the judgment of God. Because somehow, some way, even though they've been equipped with the word of God, they believe because of the people of God that they're going to kind of get away with something. That, that can happen to people's hearts and minds. They, nobody's getting away with nothing. Our heart is supposed to be right before the Lord. Amen. And, and, and this is not a message of condemnation and brow beating and beating people up. This is just a message to say, hey, let's wake up and let's keep our heart pure before the Lord where we go to him and we're honest with the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be honest with Pastor Matt. You, don't have, you, you have to be honest with who the Lord tells you to be honest with, but it starts with being honest with him. Amen. But one of the things I want you to see is I want you to imagine, because this, this passage is in the scripture. I want you to imagine a war horse. You know what I'm talking about? Like a warrior on a horse. And I want you to imagine that horse running towards the battle. Now, I've seen some gruesome movies. One of them was Braveheart way back in the day. And I don't know if y'all remember. They had a plan. And they had these long, long sticks, yep. right, that were sharpened on the edge. And they kind of laid them down and hit them. And they waited until those horses got right up on them. And they lifted up those sticks. And it just was impaling those horses. Ooh. But the thing of it is, that's the idea behind this horse that's running in the battle. He's just listening to what his master says, and he doesn't even know it. But he's just running straight for judgment. Now, that's different than a warrior for the Lord that's running to the battle, that's filled with the Holy Ghost and full of the zeal of God and ready to be a martyr for Christ, if that's what the Lord would call it. That's different. No, it is the people of God that have sin in their life that they have not repented of. And the Lord's saying, my people are like that horse, and they're running straight into the battle, and they do not understand the judgment of the Lord. It's time that the house of God, listen to me, church, this this church world that is in America, I don't know what it looks like in China, but I'm sure it doesn't look like this. This church world that's in America, and I'm not saying there's no good churches, but I'm saying we've been put to sleep by a fluffy gospel, and it's time that we wake up and that we realize God is holy, amen, and that we need to get our hearts right with the Lord. He says in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 4 through 7, Moreover, you shall say unto them, Thus says the Lord, Shall they fall and not arise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spoke not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness. 
saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Yes, the stork in the heaven knows our appointed times. The turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming, but my people know not the judgment of the Lord. Lord, help us, because listen, this will help you in more than one way, my friend. This will help you in two ways. This will help you be reminded that there's a judgment coming. Lord, I desire to keep my heart pure before you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, because I'm not working this in a way, but Jesus already, he said it is finished. Hallelujah. He did the work. Thank you. And Lord, Lord, each day I want to come and I want to be clean with you. That's the first thing it does. But let me, let me tell you the second thing it does. It reminds you of those people out there that don't know about the blood of Jesus. Remind us, Lord, that there's people that are traveling the broad way. Help us, Lord. Here's a New Testament eye opener, 1 John chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. And you know he was manifested to take away our sins. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is, and listen, I love Paul's, Paul's letters. They call them, if you go to Bible college, and I'm not trying to get all fancy on you, but if you ever see the word, you'll know it, because it'll throw you off. It's just like it shouldn't be that hard. But the Pauline epistles. It makes it sound like Pauline, like a female name, but it's not. They just added I-N-E to the end of the name. And then when they talk about John, they say the Johannine epistles. Okay. But, but we don't spend a whole lot of time in these Johannine epistles. I mean, maybe you do. In the past, I'm saying most of the time. See, most preachers stay away from Paul's letters because sometimes it can get kind of complicated theologically. But that is where I love living in there for the last eight years. But I can't say that I spent a whole lot of time in John's letters. And sometimes like I'm like, boy, you read this stuff. Come on, church. Get our, let's get our heart right. Let's read it. Verse 5. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abides in him sins not. You don't live a content, you don't continue to live a lifestyle of sin if you're in him. The Holy Spirit convicts you and you respond. Unless you have a hardened, prideful heart and you stiffen your neck and close your ear to the voice of the Lord. All right. Because see, let me tell you something else. Like while we're while we're doing this, let, let me let me explain something real quick. The blood of Jesus not only saves you from your sin and allows you to enter heaven, the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice, also broke the power of sin over your life. The new man in Christ now has victory to live above the problem of sin. And let me tell you why. Because the word of God says that all power, all principality, all authority has been placed under his feet. And the word of God says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yes. Yet not I, but he liveth in me. And so this is the thing. Jesus is the one living in me, and he's the one living through me. Jesus is the one. The old man that Matt was that was bound by sin has been crucified, buried, and a new man has been resurrected to do this life. Look, look, I want to I explain something to you. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. If you're struggling with sin tonight, you need to understand that the Bible says you don't have to struggle anymore. The Bible says you are a new creation in Christ, and if you're still having to struggle with sin, then you know what we need to do? We need to start to allow our mind to line up with what the Word of God says. That's why the Word of God says we have the mind of Christ. Well, then why aren't we living like that? Because the Word of God also says that we must renew our mind. How do we renew our mind? Not just by rote reading, but instead reading and seeing what it says and seeing that we are a new creation in Christ and believing in what God has done in us and believing in the power source that is now in us and putting our hope and our faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done for us and he is the victorious warrior and it's as simple as faith that's exactly what it is it's as simple as believing God and his word and the good news is this is that whenever we believe that and we do mess up because listen the point is this is that if I'm feeding my vessel all this stuff and I'm not feeding my vessel That's right. the That's word of the living right. God. Right. If I'm spending time watching these shows yes. and I'm not spending time in prayer, in preparation for the day that I'm about to face, then how is my mind becoming renewed to know the word of God, that I can believe the word of God, Amen. what it says that I truly am a new creation, and that sin, listen, you know what the scripture also says, and you know, I'm kind of like, 
freelance in here, but Colossians chapter 2 teaches this, that through the cross, Jesus also defeated the power of the forces of evil. He defeated the power of the forces of evil. They're already defeated, and he defeated them for you and I so that we can walk in victory. Do you realize God desires for you and I to be his hands and feet, right? We all know that. We're the body. He's the head. We just heard a teaching on that recently, an anointed teaching on that. He desires for you to be, for you and I to be his feet, his hands, his mouth. He desires to for us to, to believe him, to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover. Yeah. He desires for you and I to be mouthpieces yeah. for him. Yeah. He desires for you to go wherever the Lord's going to send you and to be a witness for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He desires for you to use your hands to help someone. Somebody was sharing with me the other day. I've been helping a, a, an older couple do, do some work and also sharing Jesus with them. He desires for you and I to be his body and to carry Jesus out into the community to release Jesus out into the community. But if I'm bound by internet pornography, the chances of me, now I'm not saying that it's impossible that I'm going to talk about Jesus, but if I'm all thrown off, and I'm just using internet pornography because I used to struggle with that. All right? Okay, there you go. So I'm not trying to call you out if you got a hidden sin in your life on the video, not in here. All right? So, but my point is, is this, is that if you're bound by that, it's, it's, it traps you it makes you a prisoner to where you can't be released to do what it is that God's called you to do. And you will literally, your conscience becomes seared. Your conscience becomes, every now and then you might think about it. I'm going to talk about some of that in a little bit. Y'all going to have to bear with me. Okay. But, but your conscience becomes seared and you're captivated by that sin. That demonic spirit that is, 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 okay. You, all right. We don't have to say possess. Can we say influence? Let's just use that. Right now, makes everybody Heavily influenced by a demonic spirit wow. to the point where when it calls your name, I wish I had a bell, when it rings, I, I can't blow the horn, and, and when it rings a little bell, boop, boop, hey. that's not what a bell sounds like. <laughs> when it gives the signal, you go running to do what it is that you're supposed to. When they blew the horn, my friend, they knew what time it was. Yeah. It was time for the 10 days of all. It's time for me to get my heart right with the Lord, right? But sometimes whenever sin gets to calling, we're like, oh, that's what time it is. No, 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 no. That means that you're a prisoner to sin. And, that, and you're not supposed to be that. Listen, that's the same thing with, a, with wrathful fits of anger. That's called a lust of the flesh. I'm talking about anger that you can't control. I've been there. I know what it feels like. And it's demonic. When you can't control your anger... When something comes over you and it causes you to unleash and you can't pull it back, that is not of God. Amen. That is something that, that is not a righteous anger. And the Lord does not want you to have to live that way. I spent a little time on the message of the cross as it comes to sanctification because I need you to have the good news that you don't have to live that way. Anymore. And it's as simple as faith. It's as simple as faith that Christ has already done it for you, that he broke the back of sin. And it's time for us to start believing the word of God and trusting him and repenting towards him whenever we've done wrong and believing that he's going to fill us up and give us the strength. The word of God says that if you submit yourself to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. That's what the word of God says. That's what I'm going to believe. And by his grace, that's what I'm going to do. Amen. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, but look, he was manifested to take away our sins. Whosoever abides in him sins not. You're not going to continue to do that. Whosoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. And this is talking about continuing and continuing in sin. All right. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. We don't have to live that way. I just sometimes want to go shake people, especially people I love, but it yes, yes. doesn't work that way. Yes. <laughs> I don't mean that. I, I might start crying. It don't work that way. I, I, oh, I'm on my knees. I'm crying out. I'm declaring. I'm praying the prayer, the prayer of a pauper and the declaration of a king. And I'm going to get, I don't know what else. I'm going to keep on doing it. That I ain't got no more breath in my lungs. I'm going to cry out to the Lord. And I'm going to believe that he's going to do the work. Amen. 
Oh, hallelujah. But sometimes I just want to go shake. And you don't have to live this way anymore. You don't have to. You can, you can yield. You can, you can yield your spirit. And you can believe in the truth. And he'll set you free. He'll yield. Talika Kume, come forth, little girl. You don't have to live that way anymore. Lazarus, come forth. Unloose him and set him free. You don't have to have those gray clothes uh, wrapped around you and binding you anymore. Jesus has come to set us free. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. You can't keep living that way. That's why you feel so bad. If you, I'm talking to y'all, whoever's out there. That's why you feel so bad right now. Because you continue to live in a way that's contrary to who you are. If you're a child of God, you're not supposed to be living that way. And it's uncomfortable. In, the, in this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loves God his brother. I wonder how often that passage is read in churches. I mean, I'm just saying, they just read a lot. I don't know, but phew, just reading it, huh? Wow. Lord, shake us up. But it's in them 10 days of all, Lord, right? So there's three specific things. I'm going to preach it. Three specific things that I'd like to focus on tonight regarding the blowing of the trumpet. I'll kind of hustle through them a little bit. But look, number one is the coronation of a king. In 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 39, it says, And Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle, and he anointed Solomon, and they blew the trumpet. And if you look up the word, it says shofar. And all the people said, God save King Solomon. Okay? So what I want you to know is Solomon was the rightful heir to the David I mean, here's another fancy word, the Davidic throne, all right? Solomon, and that just means David's throne. That's all it means. You just put an I-C on the end, and it sounds fancy, but that's all it means. Solomon was the right heir, the rightful heir to David's throne. He was the anointed king. The trumpet was blown, and the fulfillment of the rightful, the ultimate fulfillment of the right Davidic king is who? What's his name? Jesus. And so I'm connecting it back to the Feast of Trumpets. Because connecting it back to the rapture begins the, the starting point of the last days that brings Jesus to the place where he finally will be anointed. He's already anointed. He's already appointed. But he will sit. The Bible says he will sit on David's throne and there he will rule and reign the earth for the millennial reign. Amen. And so it says that in Acts chapter 2 verse 30. So that was the first thing that I wanted you to see. It's connected to the coronation of a king, the blowing of the shofar and the anointing of the king. And number two, I want to give you the rapture connection. All right. The blowing of the trumpet. Here we go. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 16 through 18. It says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So you saw that with the trump of God, the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We always have the blessed hope. Yeah, it really don't even matter. We don't even need to talk about timing tonight. What we need to know is this. A rapture is going to happen. Amen. What we need to know is this, is that the Lord is going to pull his people off of this earth. Amen. He is going to rescue his people. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 52 through 55. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, look at this, for the trumpet shall sound. Paul said, there's no question. He, he, he said, I was a man that was caught up into the third heaven. He's talking in the third person. He's like, I don't even know if I was in the body or out of the body. I was caught up in the third heaven. I saw things that I'm not even allowed to talk about. You know what he said right here? At the last trumpet, he said, for the trumpet shall sound. He wants you to know tonight. I don't know why, but he wants you to know tonight, Pamela, the trumpet's going to sound. He wants you to know, Chris, the trumpet's going to sound. Don't let nobody tell you that the trumpet's not going to sound. Don't let the devil tell you that the trumpet's not going to sound. Don't let nobody try to lie to you. The trumpet's going to sound. And hallelujah. It's going to sound. Amen. And then when it does, this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, 
and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Praise God. The last thing that I want to talk to you about regarding the Feast of Trumpets, regarding the blowing of a trumpet, if you will, is the fact that, you know, you can find some of this stuff in the traditional aspect of it. And when I say traditional, now you're talking about the, the writings of Jewish rabbis. So they're not believers. They're not, they're not spirit-filled Christians. They're not even saved. So that's why I'm not like really getting into it. But, but, but these are some of the things that they wrote, and they're connecting it to Messiah. They just don't believe that Jesus is, is Messiah. But, but look what they, what, what they do believe, that they also believe the blowing of the trumpet is connected to a warning. And that's kind of like the concept of the Feast of Trumpets. You blow, the, you blow the first trumpet, and it initiates the ten days of awe, where they afflict their soul, where they look circumspectly on the inside of their heart, preparing themselves for the Day of Atonement. I didn't really talk about it, but do y'all remember the Day of Atonement? Yes. What happens, right? The high priest, uh, he enters in through the veil, and he takes blood, and he applies it where? On the mercy seat. Yes. And what was inside the ark? Y'all remember what was inside the ark? The, the, old, the, old, the, old, the covenant. The tablets of stone. And, and, and you got the cherubim. Like, this is deep stuff. I really probably shouldn't try to. Some of y'all heard this before. You got the cherubim, though. And where are they looking? They're looking kind of towards each other, but down at the mercy seat. And so what they're looking at is, was Israel keeping the law? Has anybody ever kept the law other than Jesus? Nobody's ever kept the law other than Jesus. So what are they looking at? They're looking at broken law. So this place right here is not a mercy seat right now. It's a judgment seat. It's a judgment seat. But once a year... The high priest goes in there, what does he do? He takes blood and he sprinkles it on top, turning it into a mercy seat, covering the sin of the nation for the next year. Listen, the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 3, I believe it's like around verses 21 through 24, that he is our propitiation. If you look up that word in the Greek language, you know what propitiation means? It means mercy seat. He is our mercy seat. He is the blood. He is not just the blood applied to the mercy seat. He is the mercy seat. And he turns it from a place of judgment to a place of mercy. So what I need you to understand is that the day of atonement is judgment. But the judgment was placed on the animal, on the sacrifice. And what you and I need to understand is this, is that a, as a type of the Feast of Trumpets and the Ten Days of All and a type of repentance, we are to be reminding ourselves of the severity of what our sin caused. It caused God to send Jesus, okay, to die on the cross for our sin, amen? So, but look, as far as the warning, let me just say this. Out of Ezekiel, and you don't have to turn there, let me just read it to you, Ezekiel 33. It says, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them when I bring the sword upon any land. What does that sound like? I know I'm losing y'all, but is he about to get good? The best part is the best. Y'all want me to save it for Sunday? Are y'all ready to hang out for about five, seven more minutes? Hang on. Okay, thank you, dear. It, sa it says it right here. It says this. It says, when the sword, when I bring the sword upon a land. What does that sound like? When he's going to bring a sword on the land. That's judgment. He says, when I bring the sword on the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman. So, New Testament truth, what the Lord showed me today, is that you people, whether you realize it or not, chose to let me, in a sense, be your watchman because you come to this church. Right, right. People that go to another church, New Testament sense, are letting the pastor of that church be their watchman, all right? I'm just, I'm just because it says somebody from your coast, somebody in your area. You got about 10 different churches you can choose. I've had arguments with preachers over this. That's not even the context, Matt. No, it's the context. It's the context. The reason you don't want to believe it's the context is because now you're going to be held accountable for it. That's why you don't want to believe it's the context, but it is. He says, you take a man and you set him there for a watchman, and if when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blows the trumpet, and warns the people, then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and takes not warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. 
He heard the sound of the trumpet and he took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that takes warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman sees the sword come and blows not the trumpet, I'm telling you, church, there's a sword coming. Whether, whether America has problems before that, you can hold on to whatever you want. I'm, I'm just going to be real with you. You can put your hope in anything that you want to, but if it's not squarely placed in the Lord and your faith is not connected to him, then guess what the word of God says? That it's going to be problems. People greater than you and I have probably fallen away from the faith. Lord, help us is all I'm saying. It doesn't mean we got to fall away from the faith. I mean, we need to be clinging to him because do you not agree with me that times are bad already? I mean, but, we're, but it ain't really that bad because we got food in our refrigerator. Come on, somebody help me. I know the raven can feed you. I believe that. I'm a believer with you. But I'm just saying, times are not really that bad right now, but they bad. And people are already falling asleep. Help us, Lord. But if the watchman sees the sword and he blows not the trumpet, the people will not be warned. If the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. But I am saying this, is that the horn has to be blown and the truth has to be told. Amen. And so I'm not near as worried about how many people we got in the church as much as I am, because I believe he's going to provide as much as I am us taking what the Lord's giving us and bringing it outside of the church. Amen. That's just my, that's just, Amen. that's just where I am. Uh, where I'm living. All right? I want to share with you one more thing. No, I'm not. Singers, musicians, it was the best part. It was the best part. Singers, musicians. Okay, y'all come. I'm gonna, while they're coming up, I'm going to share with you. All right? I've, sh I've shared it a little bit recently, but you might not remember. It comes out of the Song of Solomon. It comes out of chapter 5, and I'm just going to read it to you real quick. So let me just break it down for you for a second. Solomon is the story of a king and his future bride. She's called the Shulamite woman, okay? And she loves her beloved, right? She has one dream where she's in the dream looking for him, and she can't find him. And the watchmen are like, it sounds like they're helping her. And, and they're, they're kind of like on her team. And she's like, it wasn't long after I left them that I found him. Okay, but then in chapter 5, there's another dream. And in the dream, he's knocking on the door. The scripture says to the lukewarm Laodicean church, Jesus stands outside and he's knocking on the door. Okay, so he's knocking on the door and he's saying to her, let me in, my beloved. She begins to smell the fragrance of myrrh in the air. Now, the interesting thing about myrrh is that sometimes it describes intimacy, but sometimes it describes death. What I mean by that is that Jesus, Jesus was, his body was covered with myrrh and aloe. See, myrrh is part of a fragrance that helps to disguise the smell of death, all right? This is a very interesting concept. I preach this all the time, Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7, the deceitful woman, you remember that? What did she say? The good man has gone on a long journey. Come and let us take our fill of love. I have covered my Egyptian linens with cinnamon, aloe, and myrrh. See, he thinks, that guy thinks, he's about to go have him an intimate encounter. He's thinking intimacy, right? But, with, but he doesn't understand. That's a deathbed that he's about to lay in. Because the scripture says at the end, he's about to get struck in the liver, like an ox going to the slaughter. Okay. And so many times, that's how sin, no, that's how sin works all the time. It's deceptive. It smells good, it looks good, it's yeah. enticing, it's seductive. And then when it pulls you in, it don't let you go. All right. She begins to smell, going back to the Shulamite woman. When she hears the knock upon the door in the dream, and she's in the bed. She's, she's already, it's like she's washed her feet, she's got her outer garment off, and she's laying in the bed. And she hears the knock, she begins to smell the myrrh come from underneath. So, so it's kind of like a time of intimacy is what it seems like is about to happen, right? And so she says to herself, how can I get up? I'm already going to bed. This is it's just so just such a distraction. I'm just I'm just so busy. I don't have time. And she finally gets up and she goes to and then she grabs the doorknob and the Bible says that her hands dripped with myrrh. She opens it up and he's gone. He's gone. She waited too long. She runs frantically through the streets looking 
And then she goes to find the watchman, thinking that they're going to be friends to her this time. And they beat her. And they smote her. And so, so they're angry towards her now. Because, see, she did, it's like she responded too late. She didn't hear the knock upon the door. She, it ends up being, it's kind of like the five foolish virgins. That the door was shut. And then they, they went to knock and they said, open to us. He says, I know you not. I don't know you. And so there we go. And here we live in the midst of a world that, that thinks that they have an intimate relationship with Jesus. I'm closing with this. I see sometimes videos of young people and their hands are lifted high in the air and they're worshiping the Lord. And listen to me, I'm, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I don't know what their heart really looks like towards the Lord. I'll be the first to tell you that. I hope every last one of them is head over heels in love with Jesus. But then you start talking to young people sometimes and you start talking about things like sin. And I'm talking about people in church. You start, I don't, have you ever tried to talk to people sometimes from other churches about sin and about things that the word that you know in the word of God and, and how they begin to respond? How they, they're like, that's not the love of God. Well, what are you talking about? That's not the love of God. And what I'm trying to tell you is this. It's going to be a sad day if Jesus is in there knocking on the door. And then they go, they go to open and all of a sudden their hands are dripping with burn. And all of a sudden they realize that they were wrong and that they had been lied to. And, and, and I just really feel like, I just want to share this as we close. And if you need prayer for anything, I want you to know the altars are open. Amen. I'm going to stay and worship the Lord for a little while. But I want you to, I want you to just think about that. I want you to think about this world and not just the world of the church. And somebody was sharing with me the other day, so I, I'm not going to say his name, how they all of a sudden felt in their spirit that they needed to, to go to find someone and to tell them that it was important to repent. And they, were, they, they felt it in their, in their spirit. And they, went, and they went driving to look for someone. And, and, and so what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that I believe that that is the message for the hour. I believe that that's the message of the hour. I preached a message a while back that said, under the spirit of Elijah and the message of John the Baptist, repent, repent, for the kingdom of God is here because the king is repent.